We had just moved, my husband and I, to El Paso, Texas. And he was stationed at Fort Bliss. So yes, grandfather military, father, or grandfather army, father army. I'm an army child. I married an army man. I mean, it just kept going. I didn't know what it was like not to have an, uh, a military ID card until I was, I, I was like late 30s. And I was like, what do I do? I don't have a military... How do I live like this? So, I mean, that was really strange for me. Um, but I we had just moved to El Paso. And I guess in terms of history, yeah, living, I think living in Europe, I don't want to I don't want to say it categorically that they have a, a different respect for history than we do in America, but because we respect our history, but I think it's just so much older. Everything is so much older over there that it you can't help but um, be inundated and be sort of feel like everything has a history. I mean, every building has like a really long, deep history. And so World War II was all around me in Europe, particularly. And then we went to El Paso and um, I met a German woman at a at a farmer's market who was in her nineties. And that is what sort of triggered it for me uh, because I didn't know why she, what she was doing in El Paso. And she said, after the war, I married an American soldier and moved here. And that was just lightning bolt. Um, and I had lived there. And so I was drawn to that. And I used all the, the knowledge I had from living there and loving where I lived in Germany. I really loved the people there. And I, um, and then I coupled it with El Paso, where I was at the time. And this was before, you know, the election of 2016 and all that. And at the time, immigration was still like a big issue, but it hadn't gone to like this weird, strange alt-right where it was like embraced as good to build walls and such. We were all still of the mindset that that's kind of crazy. Why would we, how would we do that when everyone's in flux so much, you know, our, and so, but we still there, that tension was building. I could feel it while I was there. So I used that and, and wrote about that. Um, so that, I loved writing that book. And I, I think that um, whenever I think about my own frustrations now, and we've talked about some of those before the show started. Um, I am trying to look back at what what were you feeling when you wrote The Baker's Daughter? Because that feeling I had then was um, a calling to speak to compassion and to speak to our culture right now while drawing from the past. And so I thought, that is what I want to do going forward again and again and again, whatever that topic might be, but I've come from a place of compassion about what's going on now to some topic while reaching back to the past for help. And, you know, that's really important for me. This is the one book where I have never been to the setting because I had tickets to fly there on March 30th, 2020. Which I really, and I booked them almost a year in advance. So I really feel like if if there was such a thing as divine intervention saying no, that would be it. March 30th, 2020. Uh, so I didn't get to go. But I, again, this is part of the Caribbean. And the Caribbean is like a, a sea like this just to get everyone. And then... So Puerto Rico is kind of in here and I grew up going there. And then Mystique Island is down at the very bottom um, near Granada and St. Vincent. And then, you know, you jump a little bit and there's Cuba. So um, so that's where it is on that that crescent. But it's all. Uh, it's all kind of in that same area. And each island ha was simply found by different um, colonizing forces. So the English, the Spanish got, you know, found Puerto Rico, the um, French, um, St. John's and, you know, so uh, that's the reason that there's different, we associate the islands with different um, 
countries, but really they were all part of the Taino Indians oh. that were all down there in that um, in that area. The Caribbean culture is all from a similar place. So it was the Indians, the Caribbean in, um, people that were natives there, and then a lot of the black slaves that were brought over to work on these, and that created what we consider now these Caribbean people and islands. And so, yes, I'm a big history nerd. So I know, again, that's the background. I know that's part of the book, but I don't preach that to the readers because they don't need to know all that information. But that's kind of where my pull was to get into this. And I heard of, about Mystique while watching a documentary on Princess Margaret where the documentary simply said that she was given uh, a wedding gift, a piece of an island called Mystique on which to build a villa. And I thought, mm -hmm. I registered at Target for my wedding and Princess Margaret gets a, a, a piece of an island. That's pretty impressive. And then when they said it was in the Caribbean, I got a little bit like, snotty I guess because I thought I know all the islands in the Caribbean these are my people I have never heard of this mystique it must be made up let me go google this and so I googled it and I that's where I learned that it um is not governed by any country it is privately owned by um the Glen Connors which now are or were um nobility aristocrats I'm looking sorry I'm over here looking at at his memoir. So this was the memoir that I worked off of. Uh, and that fascinated me because I thought, okay, maybe back in the 1800s, turn of the century, whatever, that was appropriate. But in 1972, for someone to come and buy an island with people and commerce and industry and houses and, and to say, okay, you can stay on the island but you have to then obey all my rules because this being a privately owned island I make up the rules I am the government now um or you can leave but if you leave you leave your house your culture your livestock your community everything I own it and that's really what drew me in because I thought I don't that feels entirely strange and wrong and I want to go dig in and find out more about this. Again, to what I said earlier, where I go into stories where I am wondering, how does this, how is this pertinent to us today? And this is not a dual narrative, but it started that way. I actually wrote it as a dual narrative. And then um, my editor said, "There's just make it the past. Um, but I am fascinated about, again, how that interplay between what we think we know, what we think we have heard is history by the people who were in authority to make up history, right? What does that mean when we now, as contemporary people or modern people, find out that what we thought was historical is actually just what someone told us? So that interested me too um and that's all in this book and, and it's a book about mothers and daughters because I have an obsession with with sisterhood and and female dynamics and relations so that's in this too and I also was fascinated by the idea of what happens when you are given the opportunity to have everything you think you want in life and all the luxury you could dream of what if you got it all would you be happy? Would you be fulfilled? And what I've seen over and over again in history is that when you get it all and you have it all, most times the extreme amount of anything leads to a downfall, you know, too much, too much food. You're going to get sick. Too much sex. You're gonna, it's not good. Too much of anything, too much of hedonistic, do whatever I want pleasure. You have no purpose. You have no, so anything pushed to an extreme always ends up with problems and problematic. And in the end, what 
is sacrificed or or what is gained that is the balancing act that you're having to do what will i sacrifice and the characters do willie may and her daughters to have all the pleasure of the world so then what do i gain out of that sacrifice mm -hmm. and what are the moral ambigu ambiguities that go into it 